Hi, today we're going to be looking at this human presence sensor and this is designed to be installed into the ceiling of a room and control the light that's in the room. Now this one also has Zigbee connectivity as well so it can integrate with your home automation system. I will be using this in part in Home Assistant as well but I'd like to be able to use it as an all-in-one thing just to control the lights in the room. So I bought it from this store, the Wensi Factory Store, and it arrived about six days after I placed the order. So pretty quick delivery to the UK overall. And there's a few different versions available. As you can see, there's eight in this listing here. Um, first of all, it's separated by the overall enclosure. So the type that I have bought is this one where you drill, uh, probably looks like a 50 or 60 millimeter hole in the ceiling, and then it clips through the hole, and then is very minimal, it doesn't really protrude through the ceiling at all or they've got this surface mount version uh, which sticks out quite a bit more, a couple of centimetres at least. So I've gone for the flush mount. Then there is the choice of whether you want Wi-Fi or Zigbee. It doesn't come with both. I've chosen Zigbee uh, just because I've already got some Zigbee hardware in the house, but it can work with Wi-Fi. And then you get the choice of whether you want the 5.8 gigahertz radar or whether you want the 24 gigahertz radar. And I think primarily the difference is the 24 gigahertz should be a little bit more sensitive to very, very small movements, but the range is potentially a little bit more reduced compared to the 5.8 gigahertz radar. So I've selected the 24 uh, primarily because I do want it to be uh, particularly sensitive because if I install this in the bathroom, for example, and someone's in the bath, they might want, not want the lights turning off all the time. Uh, so I think this one should do a much better job. So there's a few different ways you can use these devices. You can use it as a standalone unit where you provide mains to the input terminals here and it will give you a switched mains output on these two terminals here. The mains voltage is 85 to 265 volts so you can use it worldwide and the idea here is you just fit this in the room, connect it up to the mains and it controls your light um, when it detects someone in the room. Now you do need a Zigbee connection to set this up in the first place so you might want one of these Zigbee to Wi-Fi bridges but these don't work with Home Assistant. This is only really if you're going to use one of the apps that's available for the various mobile platforms. If you're going to use it with uh, Home Assistant you'll need something like uh, one of the Sonoff Zigbee dongles or some of the other dongles that are supported by Home Assistant. Uh, and once you have that connection, then you can set this unit up. Things like the radar power, the sensitivity, the distance range that you want it to detect within, and also how long the relay stays active for after it's not detected movement for some time. There's also an ambient light sensor behind this window here. So you can set it up to only turn the light on when the room is at a certain level of darkness, so it doesn't turn on in daylight, for example. So quite a few settings on there. So you can use it standalone, so once you set it up you can uh, disconnect the Zigbee and then not use it in that way again. Or you can use it only in Zigbee mode, so if you have connected it to Home Assistant then you can get it to automate your scenes, you can get it to control smart plugs and that kind of stuff if you want it to do it that way. Or you can use it both ways, so you have it connected to your light in your room, but also it gets signaled to Home Assistant and then you control some other devices as well if you want to. Now obviously there's no guarantee of delivery with Zigbee, so it might be preferable to use the relay output for at least one light in the room because it might detect someone in there but not be able to signal it back to Home Assistant so you could still be left in the dark. So I'm planning to use these with my home automation PCBs, which I've done a few videos on. This is the older version, but this one lives on my desk and allows me to play about with firmware. But these run from a 24 volt DC supply, so the plan here is to open this up and design a new PCB hopefully that will allow us to power it from 24 volts DC and then have a switched output that will then work with the switch inputs on this board. So rather than a relay that's going to be potentially clicking all the time I want to swap that out also for something like an optocoupler that would work well with this board. But in terms of the construction these units actually look quite nice and they've got a proper cover over the mains connections and a cord grip. So I've seen various different versions of these on AliExpress and some of them look a little bit more sketchy than others. This one actually looked quite good, but from my perspective also looked like it's very likely to be modifiable because given they've got what is clearly a PCB mount terminal, it looks just like these green ones here, there's at least going to be two boards on here. The radar sensor is going to be down the bottom somewhere. There must be another board. So it looks like the cover unscrews and then 
Uh, we've got the LEDs, so we've got, well, it looks like we've got three devices there. I know there's an LED and a photo detector. I'm not sure what the third one is for. Uh, we've got a little button here, and I think this is where the radar sits. And it looks like this should just unclip. So let's grab a screwdriver. Oh, and there we go. That's looking pretty promising. So we've got the radar module at the front, a PCV, and I think that looks like the Zigbee module behind it, and then a board going the other way, which looks to have power supply stuff on there. So this, oh yeah, it just slides out. There we go. And that looks pretty much perfect. So yeah, Zigbee module. There's a little chip there. I'm not sure what that is. And then we've got the radar these sensors, a switch, and then yeah, look, we've got the relay and all the power supply electronics on this other board. So hopefully, yeah, it looks like we've got power and Q1. Yeah, we'll have a closer look at this, but this looks like I might just be able to redesign a board here, get it made at PCB way, and then I can buy a whole bunch of these and then just modify them for my needs and that will work quite nicely. So there's quite a few devices on this PCB. It seems like you're getting decent value for money here. The first of which is on the radar PCB. And this is the S3KM111L. And it's a millimetre wave sensor SOC. It's got everything built in to do all of the radar sensing, uh, but no microcontroller as such. So um, you've got the analogue electronics here for the two antennas. You've got the DSP and we've got two interfaces for setting it up and then for reading the data out. I'm not sure why it's not on the same interface. Uh, and then we've got some power management stuff built in as well. And then if we flip the board over, we've got the Zigbee module. It's the ZS3L, which is a two-year ZS3L. Um, so this is actually a full SOC that allows you to run your application firmware and everything on here. It's got an ARM Cortex-M33. It does all of the as Digby, it's got a stack that comes with it, but you can use this basically as a complete um, applications processor for modules like this. So that's quite interesting. And then just next to it, we've got a WCH device here as well. And from looking that part up, that is a Bluetooth chipset. So RISC V MCU with BLE wireless communication. So this is another um, microcontroller on the board for Bluetooth. Now, I didn't actually see a Bluetooth antenna on this board, but I think you do need Bluetooth in order. I mean, there's a trace there that goes to P2, which would be a UFL connector, it looks like. <coughs> Excuse me. But I don't see an antenna on there, but I think you use the Bluetooth to initially configure the Zigbee connection. So, uh, yeah, I'm not sure what is going on there quite. Uh, and then we've got some power supply stuff here. So we've got a chip just underneath that capacitor down there. And then we've got another six pin chip here. So it looks like we've got two DC to DC converters. Uh, so I actually took another one of these apart here. And this one is the part that is doing the conversion from mains from what I can tell. So what it is, is a bright power BP2522. And here it is in the diagram, but as you can see, there's no feedback resistors or anything like that. And that's because this is a fixed output device. So either 12 volts or 24 volts from what I can understand on here. So that's fixed at 12 or 24, but all of the electronics seems to run on a 5 volt supply. The relay is a 5 volt device as well. So it looks like you get your 12 volts or 24 volts output. And then that's fed into this little book converter here that then gives the 5 volt regulated output. And that's all the power supplies on there, just 5 volt output to the board. Uh, I can see here, we've got a trace coming down from this leg here that goes to Q1 and then into a diode and then into the coil. So this pin here is clearly our switch output uh, to control the relay. The only thing that I've got on here that's a little bit puzzling is this trace that comes off from here, goes underneath these capacitors and then it seems to go down to uh, this resistor and capacitor. And then one of those 
connects on to the bridge rectifier. So I'm not 100% sure what that's doing. That means you'd get some kind of, um, from what I can tell, 0 0.6 volt AC signal going into this pin here. So the only thing I can assume that is for is for the ambient light sensor so that it can reject some of the flicker that you'd get from a uh, incandescent light or fluorescent light or something like that that's running in the room uh, and flickering at 50 or 100 hertz. That's the only reason I can think of where you would have a AC signal going into the microcontroller. So we've got the pair of them connected up here. One is connected to mains as it would be fresh out the box and this one is the one where I've just powered it from 5 volts and if we go into Home Assistant uh, we've got the two units here so one of them labelled AC millimetre wave and the other one 5 volt millimetre wave and I found that these units weren't picked up properly by ZHA so you have to use Zigbee to MQTT unless you want to write uh, a driver for it and you can see the two devices they've got very similar light levels being reported they're right next to each other and then we've got various settings now the description on some of these uh, I'm not 100% sure on but it's got things like the detection range so this is going to be on a 2.5 or 6 meter ceiling if I set it to 2 meters then it might not detect the cap we'll have to see if that works uh, but there's also a shield range so anything closer than 0 0.6 meters won't be picked up uh, sensitivity uh, there's a few here that I'm not 100% sure on and then there's how long the relay is on for and another one that sets the minimum off time and then it looks like the relay that's built in you can use it in two different modes you can either have it automatic so when it detects someone it clicks the relay over or you can switch over to standard mode and then you can control that relay from within home assistant so you can turn it on and off you might hear the relay click in there so you don't actually have to control it by the radar sensor. It might be used as some other automation that you've got running on the unit. Uh, and then we've got the minimum light level before the relay clicks in. So it's set to maximum at the moment, so the relay will always work. We've got an on-off for the LEDs on the unit and then an indication of the link quality. And quite usefully, these also act as a Zigbee router. So other battery powered devices can connect to these instead of a further away dongle or something like that and this will relay all of the information back to home assistant which is quite handy. So the important reading here is the presence detection which at the moment is set to true and I've set the delay right down to three seconds so if it detects no movement for three seconds then it should turn the output off. Uh, but I'm sitting extremely still here and a passive infrared sensor definitely would have turned off at this point and uh, it's still detecting true. So I'm going to try and sit here as still as I possibly can and see if these both go to false. And there we go. I had to hold my breath as soon as I started breathing again. The AC millimeter wave one, oh, they're both triggered now. So you do have to be extremely still. So this will work very nicely in somewhere like the bathroom and shouldn't present any problems. But those both seem to be working properly, uh, even without that extra signal going into the PCB. So that gives me a little bit of promise that we don't actually need whatever that signal is doing. So it's a couple of days later now, and I've had this just running from a 5 volt supply on my bench. It's been running here for about two or three days now. And it's working absolutely flawlessly. So in Home Assistant, I'm getting all the signals that I expect. Interestingly, if you set the sensitivity to about 5 or so, with it sat on the bench just here, it's able to detect through the ceiling and into the room above. So when you walk around in that room, it triggers it off, which is quite interesting. So you do want to make sure you set the sensitivity just right. Uh, but yeah, it's working absolutely fine. So I... I'm going to leave that weird signal uh, that I don't know what it does, but I haven't got a 50 hertz signal on my PCB anyway. It's going to be running from DC, so I'm not 100% sure what it does. What I did do is trace it out. It just simply goes up here, up here, and into port PB12 on the chip here. And actually what it looks like is this Bluetooth chip is the one that's doing all of the processing and they're just using a basic AT command to the Zigbee module here. And that makes sense because since you can buy this in a Wi-Fi version as well, you wouldn't want to rebuild all of the software for the Wi-Fi one uh, and try and get it working on potentially a different chipset on here. So they just swap this module out and 
uh, probably program a slightly different firmware onto here, but they can keep most of the application firmware the same. But it does, this signal does feed into here, so it must do something. I have a feeling, I am right with my hunch, it's something to do with uh, the ambient light sensing. That's the only reason they could want that synchronised waveform. But I've used it in various uh, lighting conditions, and the readings match up exactly with the one powered from the AC. So I'm not too concerned. And anyway, it's not really going to form part of my system, so I'm quite happy leaving that off. Now what I've been doing in the meantime is just getting a PCB outline and starting to put together some electronics for my new power PCB. So let's go over to KiCad because I want to get this ordered on PCB way today. The schematic is pretty straightforward. It's just a power supply and an optocoupler. So we've got here a buck converter, the LMR16006, which is a simple switcher device from Texas Instruments. And these are always really nice and easy to work with. It has a very wide input voltage range from 4 all the way up to 60 volts and an output current up to 600 milliamps. Now, I've noticed this unit draws about 90 milliamps continuously, a little bit more if you had the relay on there. So this is well within that capability, but a very simple book converter. You just provide it with power. Uh, we've got the standard book converter arrangement here and then a pair of resistors which set the output voltage. And I've set that up so that we get, uh, it's just slightly under 5 volts with these two component values here. I think it's about 4.92, which should be absolutely fine. Uh, on the input here, we've got the 24 volts and a shocky diode here just for reverse polarity protection. Not too concerned about the efficiency here, especially when it's burning a bit of power anyway all the time just for the radar. Otherwise, I'd probably put a MOSFET or something in here to increase the efficiency. Uh, then we've got various capacitors. Now this is going to be on the end of a length of cable. So we've got a fair amount of capacitance on the input and then some ceramic capacitors here and another electrolytic capacitor as well. Now I've notionally marked 470 microfarads. I don't think we need anywhere near that, but that's just for the footprint. So that's all straightforward. And then if we move down here, we've got an optocoupler, the LTV352T. And that is fed from that pad on the board to a MMBT5551, which is exa exactly what was used on the previous design with the relay there. But instead, we've got an optocoupler and a current limiting resistor. And then we're just using the Darlington output there to go directly onto the outputs to that terminal. And that will work quite happily with my circuit. We've also got, if we needed it, a back EMF diode and that kind of stuff in here for protection. So this will work quite nicely if you're switching some other kind of load. And then the only other thing we've got on here is a couple of status LEDs. So that's the schematic and I've checked over it a few times. I think everything's correct there. The next thing to do was to design the PCB. And I like to draw boxes on that kind of stuff when we've got specific mechanical constraints. So I've got some lines here for where the holes in the PCB are because when we look at the PCB, We've got these slots here, which the top PCB slides into, and we need to copy that kind of layout. So I use these markers to mark where those lines are going to be. And then in KiCad, we can use the edge cuts layer to draw a square where that needs to be. And then we've got some pads here that are exposed to allow us to solder on to those pads. So hopefully this will all come out right. Everything else is fairly straightforward. Again, I've got some boxes here in blue which mark where the terminal block should be for it to match exactly where it is on the existing design. Uh, but the layout itself is nothing too complicated. And overall, we end up with a PCB layout that looks like this, which I think looks quite nice and hopefully should work. There is a height constraint on this side because this is closest to the edge of the housing. So I've actually put no components there whatsoever. Uh, and then we just had to be careful with the placement of these capacitors because if it's too close to the edge it will foul at the top of the capacitor but also there's a slither along here on each side where this PCB slides into the casework and as you can see they've got kind of a keep out zone so you can't have any components right up to the edge of the board. So here we are at pcbway.com and we want to click on PCB instant quote and then if we click on Quick Order PCB, we can upload our Gerber files at this point here. So click Add Gerber File, and then we've got the 24 gigahertz PSU Gerbers.zip. And then it should load it. Now, 
what I've found is sometimes with KiCad exports, when you've got cuts inside the PCB, it doesn't always show the PCB just here. So what you can do if you want to just double check it is click online Gerber viewer here. And then you end up with the Gerber view page. And if you drag the zip file onto here, then you can see it. And you can see it's done these pads and everything properly just around here, which is what I wanted to check really and just make sure that the overall shape of the PCB is correct. We can check the other side as well and everything all looks fine. So that's okay. Uh, it has got the PCB size here and I want to order about 15 of these. So I'm going to click on 15. And these PCBs are actually a little bit thinner. They're one millimeter boards. Uh, and that's about all that we need to do in terms of the setup for the PCB. I only need it in green. These PCBs aren't going to be on show. Hot air solder leveled is absolutely fine. And one ounce copper. So that is looking like $19 for the 15 boards. And we'll probably need a stencil as well for the bottom side. Now, I tend to order it without the framework. And if you order it without the framework, you can add in an instruction here. Please cut the stencil to 75 millimeters by 75 millimeters, And that just makes it a little bit easier to handle. It's a little bit bigger than the PCB, so it gives a little bit of room to tape it in place. But then we don't have to handle an unwieldy uh, stencil. And it also decreases the postage slightly. So that is that. Click Calculate. And we've got our price there. So including DHL shipping, we're looking at about $56 for this PCB. So I'm going to order those. Uh, when they arrive in from our sponsor, then I'll do another video of this being assembled. So that's a little look at the Zigbee Millimeter Wave sensors. I'll put a link to this item in the description down below if you're interested in taking a look. And I will upload the PCB to the PCBWay website so that you can order it from there once I've tested it all works. So it's not worth putting up there in case I've got a problem on there. But uh, normally these arrive within about a week and I've just got the components on order as well. So hopefully they'll be there pretty quick. As soon as they arrive, we'll assemble them up and then we'll give them a proper test. So anyway, I hope you found the video useful. If you've got any thoughts or comments, don't forget to leave them in the comments section down below. Big thank you to our sponsor for this video, PCBWay. And until next time, thanks for watching.